of you that haven't yet, please go ahead and chat in your introduction into the chat box, name, organization, location, state of legalization in your state, and if there are organizing efforts happening around um, justice reinvestment campaigns that are looking to reinvest the revenue in communities of color. I think we're ready, Will. All right, we're good. Hi, everybody. My name is Monica Cordova. I am the Deputy Director at the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing, and we want to welcome you to our webinar today. It is going to be a, a lively discussion, and we think it's a really critical issue. Um, the webinar today that we're looking at is uh, Organizing for Marijuana Policy, Opportunities for Justice Reinvestment and Racial Equity, and um, we hope that you, throughout the webinar, think about some of the questions you might have for the panelists. And my slides aren't advancing. We want to tell you, we want to start off the webinar by telling you a little bit about who we are as the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing. We are a funding and capacity building intermediary that invest that sees youth organizing as a critical strategy for social change and my slides aren't advancing so we will go forth without them let me just say one last thing as we're doing I was this seeing the introduction slide i know the, there may be a delay on the advance just give it a second advance the slide I, and then wait right right Great. Here we go. We're doing a slideshow. No, it's not. there we go. Back to who we are. The Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing. We're a funding and capacity building intermediary for the field of youth organizing. We really see youth organizing as a critical strategy for social change. And we do two things primarily. One, we really invest in the field through capacity building opportunities, grant making initiatives, and opportunities for shared learning and strategizing. And so these, this webinar series um, that we do uh, about once a month is an opportunity for us to uplift particular issues that are facing um, young people across this country and uh, reach, reach a broader audience that can engage in the discussion and hopefully learn something. The other part of what we do is really work with philanthropy to understand the important impacts young people of color are making in this country um, and really hope to move more investment into the field um, and into areas that are oftentimes under-resourced. So that's a little bit about the Funders Collaborative. If you would like to learn more about us, I encourage you to go to our website, fcyo.org, and we have a bunch of different resources up there. We keep um, uh, it pretty updated with communications and stories from the field, and you can uh, um, learn more about our, our work. Um, as a part of our program, Youth Corps, the Youth Community Organizing Resource Exchange, is what the webinar series is a part of. And this is um, the, the, the programmatic part of our organization that we see um, as it aims to help build a stronger and more sustainable youth organizing field. So again, um, this is the, the opportunities that we try to reach um, organizers and young people and folks doing social change work out there in the communities and provide opportunities for learning and, and hopefully reach a broader audience than we can in some of our other um, learning opportunities. So again, we want to welcome you to our webinar. Um, we hope that you continue to stay engaged with us. And I'm going to hand it over to Jay, who's going to give you a little bit more about what today's webinar is, is about and introduce the panelists we have um, with us today. Well, um, hello everyone. Uh, FCYO is proud to support the work of youth-led organizing groups um, that are engaged in working on powerful campaigns to end the school to prison pipeline, youth leaders that are the driving force behind divest and invest campaigns, and young people that are at the forefront of work to end police murder and brutality. And so today's webinar, which is how to organize on marijuana policy, um, opportunities for adjustment, reinvestment, and racial equity, 
ties directly into the work that we do to support youth organizing efforts aimed at making sure that our communities are not further criminalized and that we have just policies that do not um, further incarcerate <laughs> and unjustly target um, black, brown, immigrant youth throughout the country. So there are a number of states that are legalizing marijuana and collecting significant tax revenues as a result. So how do we make sure that the tax revenue that is being generated and collected is not further used to criminalize our communities? And that's what we'll delve into today with today's discussion. The webinar that we're um, that we're doing today will look at how organizing groups can work to influence marijuana policy and win new resources for justice reinvestment and for health and education supports for young people and adults of color. We will look at examples from California of how organizing efforts are laying the groundwork for racial justice wins. So we'll have a few presenters today. Uh, we have Malachi, Saku Amin, who is the president and CEO of the California Urban Partnership. Um, he has been involved in work that has told the stories of people organizing for economic security as a journalist, and he's also pioneered innovative business support programs in communities of color. He's currently leading the R Hemp Network. Um, the Racial and Health Equity and Marijuana Policy Network, which is a coalition of racial justice and policy um, groups in Sacramento and at the state capitol. We'll also have Jody Johnson, who's a facilitator of Blacks Making a Difference. Jody is the facilitator of African American youth organizing efforts in Sacramento, and he um, also provides young people with guidance needed to explore their identity as black youth, while encouraging young people to re-examine negative stereotypes and establish a more positive identity to navigate through their academic and social lives. And last, we will also have Jim Ketty, who is the executive director of, of Youth Forward. Jim is a longtime community organizer, and he's also the form, a former foundation president um, who's worked um, done strategic work at the California Endowment. Um, at the Endowment, Jim laid the groundwork for the foundation's youth organizing strategy, and he is also co-leading the R Plus Hemp Network with Malachi Saku Amen. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the panelists. And I believe we're going to start with Malachi? Yes. Thank you, Jay for that introduction. Uh, again, I'm Malachi Sekou Amen, president of the California Urban Partnership. And about, um, well, first of all, I wanna say thank you uh, to the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing uh, to um, really um, uh, thank them for putting this on because it, you know, this, this issue around uh, marijuana policy and racial justice uh, is one of the uh, most important uh, uh, issues facing our nation with respect to uh, addressing uh, mass incarceration, addressing uh, racial wealth gaps, and also the health and well being of communities of color. Um, when we look at the war on drugs and this new boom, uh, around the marijuana industry and uh, racial justice, you know, we know that uh, uh, there are many luminaries, many uh, opinion uh, leaders. Uh, one uh, is Michelle Alexander, a legal scholar and author of The New Jim Crow. You know, she said that nothing has contributed more to the systemic mass incarceration of people of color in the United States than the war on drugs. And as that relates to why we're here today, you know, we want to highlight that 
over many decades, the criminalization of marijuana has taken a devastating toll, particularly on African-American and Latino families. And thousands of men and women were sent to prison, separated uh, 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 families, uh, and, and marijuana arrests uh, dramatically increased poverty. Next slide. So the legacy of the war on drugs is that, you know, the suffering continues in the form of reduced access to affordable housing, vacant and blighted commercial and residential properties, struggling entrepreneurs of color, and lifelong joblessness for people with felony convictions. Next slide. According to the ACLU, African Americans have been arrested at rates 3.7 times greater than whites for marijuana related crimes. Uh, at the national level, of the 8.2 million marijuana arrests between 2001 and 2010, 88% were for simply having marijuana. Uh, next slide. Uh, when we look at examples of, of local arrest data uh, in California's uh, cities like Oakland, uh, in 2015, African Americans accounted for 77% of marijuana arrests while making up 30% of the population. And here in Sacramento, we were uh, presented with recent data uh, from 2012 to 2016 around how African Americans consisted of 43% of marijuana arrests while making up only 15% of the population. But we suspect that with uh, uh, analyzing a longer period of time that the marijuana arrest rates for African Americans would be a lot higher than 43%. Next slide. Uh, and so just looking at um, the picture nationwide, uh, you can see in this chart here, uh, pink representing uh, uh, whites, and then uh, the black line representing African Americans. Uh, you see dramatic uh, uh, differences. One uh, most notably in Cook, uh, Illinois, uh, where the the marijuana arrest rates for African Americans um, uh, is probably seven times greater than uh, that of whites. Um, really interesting slide to, to, to look at. Um, next slide. And um, so in terms of marijuana uh, legalization, I want to have Jim uh, Ketty step in at this, this point and talk about what's happening uh, around the country. No, thank you, Malachi. <clears throat> so what we want to do in the next couple of slides is just talk about how marijuana legalization is spreading across the country and the trends that we're seeing. So to date, um, eight states in Washington, D.C. have legalized both recreational and medical marijuana. 29 states have legalized medical marijuana fully. Um, earlier, this, earlier this year, uh, we saw legislation pending in 17 states to fully uh, legalize marijuana. And we're seeing, you know, the emergence of a powerful industry, the marijuana industry that's hiring top lobbying firms across the country. On this next slide, you'll see we, we have a map here of a uh, where uh, of legalization. So the states that are dark green are the states that have fully legal, both medical and recreational marijuana. And as you can see, it's pretty much the West Coast and the Northeast. Um, the states that are the next uh, darkest shade of green are states that have full, fully legal medical marijuana. So Arizona, New Mexico, Illinois, Minnesota, most of the Northeast, Florida. The states that are the lightest green are the states that allow for some very limited form of medical marijuana, typically medical marijuana that does not uh, have THC 
and only has the, uh, the CBD element in it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the states that are white are the states that have neither any form, neither medical or recreational marijuana legal in any form. And, you know, what I see happening here is uh, uh, in terms of the trend is, is, you know, I think we're seeing legalization grow, obviously, on the West Coast. I think New Mexico may be the next state to go fully legal. On the Northeast, I, I would anticipate that most of the states in the North, Northeast will be uh, fully legal in the next few years. There are certainly efforts underway in many of those states now to uh, legalize adult use. And then I think there are some blue states in the middle that are likely to, uh, to go in that direction. I know there's legislation that has been pending in Illinois and uh, you know we're likely to see Minnesota <clears throat> or Ohio go in that direction as well. And what's <clears throat> underneath the, the move towards full uh, legalization, of course, is a ch a, a changing uh, social norms. So we're witnessing a significant change in public perception of marijuana. Here in California, we uh, legalized medical marijuana 20 years ago. And the notion of medical marijuana has really, I think, become the dominant way people understand marijuana today. We're seeing uh, in public opinion polls across the country, a growing majority supporting legalization and a growing majority that understands that the war on drugs has been a mistake and that supports decriminalization. Part of that social norm change is the shift in view from, you know, reefer madness to the view that recreational marijuana is harmless. The recreational use of marijuana is harmless or even good for you. And we're going to talk a little bit li later in this presentation about some of the adverse health effects of marijuana use, particularly related to young people. And then part of what's driving this too is that marijuana is emerging as an influential industry that's being driven primarily by uh, white investors and white entrepreneurs. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Malachi who's gonna share with you some of the lessons we've been learning uh, from doing this work in California. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. And before I go into the lessons from California, you know, I just want to talk a little bit more about those uh, uh, changing social norms and, you know, how we've moved into this uh, uh, industry, uh, which is primarily uh, benefiting wealthy uh, white investors. You know, um, there is a, a problem with the, 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 the typical narrative that we're continuing to deal with um, around um, uh, wealthy uh, white investors who believe that um, there is no need to, to address the problems of, of the past. Uh, we're also seeing legislation now that was recently signed by the governor of California that allows um, police to uh, have uh, reasons to stop and arrest, to cite those who uh, are passengers inside of cars, not the driver, but the passenger inside of the car, be able to arrest um, uh, those who are consuming marijuana. And so there are concerns about um, this as it relates to the uh, lack of scientific protocols uh, to determine whether someone is intoxicated or not. So we're you know, continuing to see um, these moves that are hostile not only to um, uh, people of color, but also uh, the, the, the problem with uh, racial uh, wealth gaps not being addressed because of the limiting of uh, who can participate in this industry. So let's go into the lessons from California. Uh, California voters legalized medical marijuana over 20 years ago. Uh, last November, voters passed Proposition 64, which legalized recreational marijuana use. 
And the marijuana industry in California is expected to grow to $6.7 billion by 2020. Across the nation, uh, that number for, mar for the marijuana industry is expected to reach somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 billion uh, uh, by 2022. The other lessons from California on the, on the uh, positive side, there has been decriminalization uh, of legal possession, of sale, of cultivation and manufacturing. We've in many ways removed the uh, infractions for minors and the crimes uh, uh, for uh, possession and, and sales and, and in some cases have, have been moved to misdemeanors. The negative side, uh, again, is we have this transfer of wealth from an underground economy to a legal one. And there, when we passed Prop 64, there was a tremendous lack of equity in economic development. Um, when we look at the, the typical narrative of how someone went into jail, got out, uh, couldn't get a job, housing, college tuition, children were traumatized, couldn't buy a house, the families couldn't buy a house or start a small business, and then the neighborhoods end up getting uh, uh, destroyed because there's decay, there's blight, uh, there's a destabilizing dysfunction that's happening. And then ultimately what happens is those who are uh, positioned with financial resources are gentrifying uh, these neighborhoods and people are being pushed out of the neighborhoods that they've known all of their lives. So, so this lack of equity and economic development is a huge issue with respect to uh, uh, you know, how um, marijuana policies are, are implemented, uh, not just in California, but across the nation. Um, another negative side in California is we're seeing that um, uh, the health impacts of recreational youth, particularly for young people, are not being uh, addressed. And the industry is promoting this. Of course, we, you know, we, we, we know that um, uh, this is a public health issue as opposed to um, a, a criminal justice issue. Uh, but in that whole vein, we need to understand that uh, at an early age, uh, young people's uh, brains are still uh, developing. And so we need to be very intentional about how we protect um, uh, our young people. And then um, in terms of uh, the legalization process, you know, again, there's been a, a, a transfer of wealth. Uh, from an underground economy to a legal economy, primarily benefiting uh, white entrepreneurs and investors. And so on uh, going further into our uh, racial justice approach that we've begun uh, here in California uh, with a network that Jim and I uh, began uh, about uh, about uh, eight months ago, uh, the Racial Plus Health Equity and, and Marijuana Policy Network, um, you know, we've really started to frame these issues around racial justice in, and in terms of, um, you know, how we, we, we take a close look at uh, decriminalization and regulation using a reparations framework. So at that point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Jim. Great. Yeah. So in talking about uh, the racial justice approach, certainly central to any racial justice approach is decriminalization and Proposition 64 um, did a good job of that in our view. It reduced or eliminated uh, most penalties for marijuana offenses. And currently adults who are serving time or on probation or parole and petition for resentencing uh, or for reclassification in California 
Prop 64 amended penalties for four uh, off areas of offense, possession, cultivation, possession with intent to sell and sales and transport of marijuana. And then for young people under the age of 18, uh, where it's still illegal to use marijuana, to have marijuana, um, those uh, young people are now only going to be faced with infractions and uh, no fines attached to those infractions. So we have made, I think, decent progress in decriminalizing marijuana. But as you'll hear in a, as we go forward, so there are some additional questions or concerns that we're raising around further criminalization. So uh, in the reparations approach, um, in the area of economic development, we've been asking how do communities most impacted by the war on drugs participate in the new wealth generated by legal marijuana? And then in the area of tax policy, we've been asking uh, our policymakers and encouraging the public to ask these questions. You know, how do tax revenues generated by marijuana go to repair some of the damage caused by the war on drugs. And when we talk about some of the damage, I think that's, that's a key word because um, how, do you, how do you repair a, a war that, that really began in, in, the, in the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s? But, um, but you can only repair some of the damage um, uh, because it's, it's, it's difficult to measure, but but again, you need to be very intentional about it. Um, how can these tax dollars support investments in re-entry, uh, youth of color, and economic opportunity? And so Jim and I have developed a, a framework uh, at the R Plus Hemp uh, Network uh, that we hope to share uh, with, with many of you. Um, that talks a little bit more about the reparations approach. Um, and we'll talk about it today, uh, briefly. But on the next slide, in the area of economic development advocacy, uh, we have advocated that to support the participation of people of color and those directly affected by marijuana arrests, Local and state government can set aside a percentage of permits uh, and licenses. And we've seen a precedent in the city of Oakland uh, where this is being done. Uh, uh, there can also be the creation of a business incubator uh, program that provides technical assistance to help the small businesses grow, um, that helps them to access markets uh, that, um, incorporates a loan fund, a revolving loan fund, and also other activities such as uh, uh, venture capital salons that would allow uh, the operators inside of an incubator to access uh, 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 private equity capital uh, through private investors. Um, another idea is to set hiring goals for who works within these various marijuana businesses from all parts of the supply chain, uh, whether it be uh, growing, whether it be manufacturing or testing or distributing or even the retail outlets. And then, um, you know, we think the economic development supports could include supporting contracts and new businesses in ancillary industries such as construction, security, um, uh, employment um, agencies, graphic design firms, the list really runs the gamut. And, um, and, and finally, one of the other ideas is to uh, remove the employment and the ownership barriers. And you know, I think it's very important uh, for organizers to be very strong about um, uh, uh, declaring that we will accept nothing as communities of color than ownership in this industry. We've well earned a right to be owners in this industry. 
Uh, and so any fees uh, or criminal uh, background record um, barriers uh, should be removed. In, in Sacramento, one of the barriers uh, in terms of the application fee, what we've seen is of, of uh, an application fee to, to get in uh, is at $45,000 just to file an application. And so when we look at uh, racial wealth gaps and how it will take 228 years at this point in time for the average uh, black and Latino family wealth to catch up with the wealth of whites, um, we can tell you right now who will be able to afford $45,000 for an application fee to sell weed. Um, it definitely won't be brown and black communities. Um, and so on the tax policy advocacy side, I'd like to uh, turn this over to Jim. Good, yeah. And just by way of context, I should mention that uh, Malachi and I and Jody and others have been working here in the city of Sacramento for the last uh, four or five months, challenging our city to change its economic development policies related to our local marijuana industry. We've been pushing for these policies to be put in place and are making some good progress. Uh, recently, we had a coalition meeting with the mayor of Sacramento in which he agreed to many of these elements. Um, in addition to economic development, we've also been uh, challenging the city around marijuana tax revenues. Our city expects to bring in an additional 20 to $40 million in new revenues. And we've been urging the city to invest those dollars into things such as reentry programs for, and, and uh, with job placement and mental health supports, support for youth development in neighborhoods that were, have been most impacted by criminalization. And the way we're uh, getting the city to identify what those neighborhoods are is through a mapping of marijuana arrests um, so that we're able to see what were the neighborhoods uh, most impacted by the war on drugs. And we would encourage you all as you're working on this at the local or at the state level to uh, get your hands on marijuana arrest data or challenge your uh, local public officials to use, to get that data and to analyze it. We're looking at how revenues can support economic development in those neighborhoods. And then finally, we're also um, very much raising the public health issues around marijuana use and are looking for a much greater investment in prevention um, and policies that over time will reduce marijuana use among young people and support for uh, substance abuse services. And uh, we wanted to raise a, a, a wrinkle here in California, which we think may be similar to other parts of the country, which has to do with local government and marijuana policy. So across California, as cities and counties have passed ordinances and have established a local marijuana industry, uh, as you heard in Sacramento, these local communities are bringing in new tax revenues. And those tax revenues uh, to date are all flowing into the general funds of cities. And they're gonna grow over time and they're substantial. As you, know, as you mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Sacramento expects to bring in 20 to 40 million. The city of LA has an initial projection that they'll generate uh, $50 million in new revenues. I think that's probably a pretty conservative estimate. And our concern is that as, as tax revenues grow, there's the real risk that uh, those tax revenues will flow uh, in a significant way to law enforcement. Uh, you know, in, a, in California, law enforcement makes up the biggest uh, chunk of any city or county budget. And uh, law enforcement, of course, has a lot of uh, political clout. And they are making the argument that legal marijuana, the legalization of marijuana is going to require more enforcement. Uh, there is really no evidence that that, that exists. Um, like here in Sacramento, we have 30 medical marijuana dispensaries. They've been here for a long time. Uh, the UCLA did a study that shows that having a medical marijuana dispensary in your neighborhood does not increase crime. 
but uh, there is the real risk here that in the absence of organizing, in the absence of folks pushing for tax revenues to go towards you know, uh, racial justice types of uses, that we could be um, uh, continuing the war on drugs in a sense by this, this new funding source will go to law enforcement. Uh, some other concerns related to uh, the future um, and further targeting of communities of color. Um, in many communities, as I mentioned, law enforcement and public officials are now calling for a crackdown on illegal marijuana businesses. In our view, this crackdown represents a new wave of criminalization and it could you know, further push families into poverty that depend on the underground economy. And I also wanted to raise a real concern that exists uh, with legal marijuana around undocumented folks and legal residents. So, you know, it, it'd be, uh, I think, uh, normal to think living in California that like everyone else, uh, you have the ability to use marijuana, to work in the marijuana industry. But in fact, if you're undocumented or if you're a legal resident, you could be putting yourself at risk uh, with, for deportation or for other um, uh, effort, efforts against you because the federal law on marijuana, of course, is still that marijuana is illegal. So you could be putting your, legal, your status here in California in jeopardy. So there's issues around immigration and marijuana policy that need to get addressed, uh, certainly at the federal level, and it's something that we need to spend more time on and figure out what does this really mean at the local level. I think there's, that's, it's a real threat. And then finally, we also wanted to um, touch upon uh, concerns around health. So the recreational use of marijuana is harmful for young people. There's a, you know, extensive research that shows the frequent use of marijuana among adolescents leads to delays in brain development. It can make it harder for young people to learn and retain information. There is evidence that it can make it harder for young people to do well in school, to graduate. There's also evidence that shows that the younger someone starts using, the greater at risk that person will have, that young person will have for problem use and addiction. Um, there's evidence that for young parents, young, uh, young uh, uh, pregnant women who use marijuana, are at risk for uh, low birth weight uh, with their babies. And of course, of course, low birth weight raises a whole, a whole range of health concerns for infants. And then we're also concerned about how as the marijuana industry evolves, becomes more corporate, that it will be going down the same path as al alcohol and tobacco. It will target its advertising at young people of color and will locate its stores and businesses in lower income communities. And that's certainly the case here in uh, Sacramento, where we have a uh, concentration of marijuana billboards that uh, in low-income neighborhoods here in our city. And these billboards, you know, promote this notion that, uh, you know, you're going to feel better, that this is a form of stress release, relief, which certainly it is. But those billboards, just like in the past, tobacco billboards also influence young people and youth consumption. So there's a whole range of public health issues here that uh, we need to get up to speed on. And for many people, um, you know, given the way that we've understood uh, marijuana under medical marijuana, this may be new information. Um, what we're gonna do now is turn it over to Jody Johnson. And Jody is someone who's been thinking very deeply about this as it relates to young people. And he's gonna share with us some of his thoughts about both the content we've covered so far, as well as kind of where he's going and the work he's doing with young people. So I'm gonna turn this over to Jody. Uh, good morning, all. Um, so in regards to the, to the youth component, I think um, the biggest piece of advice would be engaging the youth that are actually impacted by this criminalization and the policies that are gonna roll down. I think oftentimes we forget that um, in engaging youth and providing youth voice, you actually need youth that represent the, the, the issue area. Um, and I think along those lines, um, what we're able to do here in Sacramento, um, we're actually targeting youth that have a perspective that is unique to their particular circumstances and situations. So we're, we're targeting the most um, 
disengaged, out of reach youth that actually have the knowledge of how to actually produce change. Um, I think as we, um, as we take an approach that I like to call the four E's, engage, empower, educate, and embrace, um, it's essential to really, really, really start thinking about those that are impacted, those that have um, parents that have been um, criminalized, that have been in and out of prison, those that use, um, use marijuana for self-medication purposes, kind of along the, the public health lines that um, Jim was referring to. Um, in order to figure out alternatives, you have to engage those that are actually using and actually depending on them. Um, the empowerment piece comes from shifting um, the narrative from trying to tell young people how to engage to giving them the tools to understand why they should engage. Um, once you educate them to a point to now I understand why this is impacting me, now they're able to bring a different perspective. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've uh, me and Jim have been talking and I've decided to bring on board two, two young people who are battling with the effects of you know the war on drugs post with parents and, and really trying to get ahead of um, where this thing is going. And they're able to provide a different level of perspective that you wouldn't get um, ordinarily with just a room full of adults. I think part of um, the youth organizing piece is how do you ensure that those that are impacted by this actually have um, influence over what's coming down the table. Um, like, like Jim just said, there's massive billboards that are, that are targeting and centralized in these neighborhoods and communities of color that impact the, the young people. So how are we giving them a voice? Um, one of the, the suggestions were um, youth, youth focus groups. Um, and I think as we are moving towards the educational piece of marijuana policy for the young people, these groups are able to now be more youth run and organized, which allows for a little bit more innovation um, as we move forward. Um, one thing that I have um, noticed as I'm engaging young people is that they're really, 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 really in tune with the economic development piece. Um, so it's like, uh, that represents the last E of, of, the, of the four E's, it's embracing the fact that the young people are one, powerful within themselves, and two, like they actually have more answers than we give them credit for. So like at 15, 16, 17, they're already thinking about economic development, which is a component of the policies that are about to come down the pipe. So how do we, how do we ensure that youth voices, giving them the, the stage and platform to be able to go to these, these meetings, be able to write a letter to their local politician, be able to really engage in the level of conversations that we're on now? Jody, can you also speak to how you see the, the criminalization, the ongoing criminalization and how you, you, what you're seeing how young people are viewing that and what that concerns about? Yeah, so, so as the, the, the industry becomes more and more uh, regulated, um, the offenses that are actually being targeted are gonna be the, the, um, the minor offenses. Like a, I had a young person tell me the other day um, that he didn't know that it was illegal for a person under 18 to have marijuana in their possession. Which was, which was very, very, very insightful on his part. But I think as the criminalization piece continues to grow, like their lack of education around it um, presents an issue because now you have a crackdown, as, as was stated earlier, that's going to be targeted within these communities, which means that there is going to be more violence. The kids are, are talking about the violent pieces. They're talking about how their communities are becoming more and more infused with law enforcement. So it means their interaction with law enforcement is increasing. So from a, a young people's perspective, they're seeing an influx of, of law enforcement, influx of more um, law enforcement interaction and engagement, which is actually turning into more and more um, criminality and criminal activity. Yeah, great, thank you, Jody. Okay, before we move on into uh, recommendations uh, in terms of painting the picture, I just wanted to see if Malachi, if you'd like to add anything just in terms of informing organizing, what have, what have you been learning about the organizing process here in Sacramento? How have you built the coalition? What have we learned from interacting with the public officials? If you could speak to that, Malachi, I'd appreciate it. 
Sure. <clears throat> I think one of the things we've been learning is that uh, uh, in many cases around uh, the state of California, when we start talking about uh, uh, ownership in the industry, when we start talking about um, the police crackdown of of uh, underground operators uh, and how to move into this industry in a sound way that uh, provides economic opportunity that uh, protects the health of our young people. What we've been learning, I think, is that these requests for equity have been on the, you know, the last thing that uh, elected officials and uh, uh, other decision makers have uh, uh, had on their minds. So, so I think um, being very intentional, being very unequivocal of, about the fact that equity needs to be placed on the front end uh, as opposed to the, the back end of how uh, we're implementing these policies you know, it's going to be very important um, when we look at how the the, the uh, marketplace will open in California in in January, for all intents and purposes. Um, without having equity on the front end, that means that you're going that we're, what we're going to see is all the white wealthy investors who ha who can afford um, uh, tens of thousands of dollars to get a license uh, can attract capital they will be able to to start uh, the race they will be able to get out of the gate early um, and whether you're, you're you're running on foot or whether you have a big uh, automobile that has the, the, the biggest engine, um, uh, they will be able uh, to uh, have automobiles with big engines while communities of color are on, on foot and haven't even had a chance to get out uh, into the race uh, and, and start. And that is exactly what happens when you have uh, uh, fairness and equity as an afterthought as opposed to something that should happen right away that should be the highest priority. Um, what else uh, have uh, we learned? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, we've learned that, um, you know, really for organizers, we need to start early. Uh, we need to assess, uh, you know, uh, where uh, we are, connect with other drug policy advocates and public officials, uh, supportive of uh, legalization. And this is, of course, recommendations for organizers in states that are moving towards uh, legaliz legalization. Um, uh, advocate for equity language. Uh, and again, you know, uh, Jim and I uh, have developed some equity language that we're happy to share with uh, those uh, on this webinar today. Uh, and that have that equity language reflect a, a reparations frame and public health uh, in the uh, legislation or the ballot measure that uh, will come up for a vote. And then, of course, push for an equity formula in how the tax revenues are allocated. In California, for Prop 64, <clears throat> yes, there there were some good things that are that uh, that were put in there around uh, supporting youth development at the state level. Um, there are some public health um, uh, investments. There are some uh, investments for law enforcement, uh, but the formula in California has has um, a general uh, type of direction in terms of how the tax dollars will be spent. It doesn't look at the communities that were most impacted, and so um, 
uh, organizers and states that are moving towards legalization have a chance to to be more proactive about making sure that equity um, uh, is put in 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 the in the legislation, and then of course engage young people um, and those directly affected. Um, recently, in Sacramento, uh, Jim and I, and actually Jody was a part of uh, our 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 organizing effort at a concert. It was the Common and J. Cole concert, and it was a part of a, a campaign uh, put on by the Anti-Recidivism Coalition to promote justice reinvestment, to promote um, uh, um, education as opposed to incarceration. And there were probably about, uh, oh my God, there were probably, at least 12,000 people out there. And so we had them sign, we, we, we organized uh, youth, we brought youth together. Uh, we had them collect petitions from uh, people who were attending the concert. Uh, and we were preparing to submit those uh, signatures to our city mayor and members of the city council. Uh, and then we also had, um, uh, an invitation that we sent out to the television news media, the uh, newspaper um, outlets uh, to come and take a look at what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so these are some, some great ways, I think, for organizers and, and states moving towards legalization uh, to really um, get out in front of this thing early and to do it from a position of power so that we can win, because we can win this. We've earned the right to be winners uh, in this space. Great, thanks Malachi. Yeah, so, so uh, just in terms of wrapping, in terms of wrapping up, we just wanted to share our last slide that has our contact information. And then I think we're going back to Monica or to Jay for questions. Am I, am I right. So if folks will not, thank you all very much. That was both um, some of the comments were, um, you know, folks are, I think, excited to, for you to share your slides. So one, everybody should know we will be able to share both the slides and this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website if you want to watch it again, if there was something um, you, could, you missed. Um, I want to flag to folks that there is a chat box and a Q&A box. We will be fielding questions from the Q&A box. So um, just uh, a couple of icons over from your chat is the Q&A box. And that both gives us an opportunity to uh, read aloud questions, but also um, for any of the panelists, if you see the Q&A box, um, you can also uh, type in responses if it's quick responses. So please, um, for participants, use the Q&A box and we will begin to build questions to the panelists. And it looks like our question uh, from Adam is, when talking about the public health aspects of the issue, how have the panelists been thinking about and organizing around health equity as it relates to cannabis, i.e. ensuring safe and affordable access to medical marijuana for all who need it? Yeah, I can respond to that question and thank you, Adam. Let me just recognize that in this, uh, the slides we've shown, the conversation we've had, we have neglected to have a conversation about medical marijuana and uh, certainly the, uh, the appropriate uses of marijuana for various medical conditions. And in, in, in reflecting on that, I think it's just because we tend to take medical marijuana for granted in California and I know that's not the case in other states. And certainly uh, organizing and folks working to support access to medical marijuana is, 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 a, is an important issue in the overall picture of health equity. And I, I appreciate the question being raised. Great, thank you. And if anybody is watching us on Facebook Live, you can always um, ask, ask questions to the comments on Facebook and we'll try to bring those forth. Um, next, we have a question from Andrea. Andrea actually has two questions. The first one is, in communities highlighted today, what conversations are local foundations or funders having about marijuana? And are they helping with this conversation? 
Well, I guess I'll take that one as well, since I'm the former foundation person on the panel. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that foundations, at least in California, have been very slow to come to the conversation. Um, I, I think there's a, a generational gap that exists uh, with uh, older folks not really uh, up to speed on what's going on. And to some extent, marijuana kind of feeling like, um, I, don't know right the, I don't know what the right word is for, but it, it takes a while for people to come around to understand what's going on and this perspective. And uh, my experience, particularly with white foundation leaders, it takes a few conversations to, mm -hmm. to, for them to start to understand both what's going on with the marijuana industry and with the racial equity issues. But in general, I think it, it takes time for people to get this. It takes time for people in the organizing field as well, because we typically haven't looked at uh, marijuana for example, from a tax revenue perspective or a justice reinvestment perspective. So Malachi, you've been in a bunch of these meetings with the foundation folks where we've been trying to educate people. Anything you'd like to add? Um, you know, I, th I think um, the foundations, you know, in many cases have uh, criteria, funding criteria around uh, health, around justice reinvestment and around youth programs. And so, you know, I've, you know, for me, it has been, um, you know, a, a challenge because of the narrow view taken by, you know, foundations a, a, around focusing on economic development and dealing with um, uh, the, the need for organizing to promote economic development just as much as as health issues, uh, because uh, economic uh, well-being is just as much a part of the social determinants of health um, as anything else. Um, but I think, um, uh, you know, we 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 found um, uh, that in talking to to, to foundations. Um, you, you really want to uh, uh, to to weave in uh, the the economic development picture uh, even 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 though you know we're mostly talking about uh, 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 justice reinvestment in terms of education and uh, you know other social addressing other social issues but I think we we have an opportunity to weave in uh, the economic picture. And I, I can chime in on that a bit. Um, kind of to Malachi's point, you have to kind of figure out how to weave it in. Um, we've been working with the uh, endowment a bit, trying to launch a youth campaign around, um, around the justice aspect. And we're, we're getting real creative to try to, try to steer the message to economic development. So we're, um, targeting changing the narrative, not only for, um, you know, the, the justice and the criminalization of, of, of the black community, but as well as the, the health component. Um, so I think with the foundation is it, just like Malachi said, it's about how do you weave it in a bit and how do you try to find the flow of what they're able to support, how they're able to support and then bring it all together. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that part, um, still in the planning phases of everything, but I think the more and more conversations that are had about um, education around uh, marijuana, education around policies and, and, the, uh, and the need for equity and justice, I think the better um, equipped we'll be to be able to have those conversations with foundations. Great, and I wanna uh, move us on to our next question because we have a, a good list going here. Um, the next question I think is, 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 related, is related, but how can listeners help normalize this conversation within the sector? Hmm. Well, I think, you know, one of the ways to normalize the conversation is, is to really frame this in, in a way that would have uh, uh, decision makers, um, you know, the public, um, everyday uh, activists and those concerned about justice and fairness and equity uh, 
um, whether they support marijuana uh, or not, is yeah. to is to say that you know this is here. Uh, it's not going away. Uh, we've always known that we need to deal with marijuana as a public uh, health issue, as opposed to a criminal justice issue. And so we can sit aside, sit, uh, um, sit down, and put our heads in the sand if we if we want to. But you know, if if you even if you don't. Uh, support marijuana uh, consumption. Um, mm. It doesn't make sense to sit down and do nothing about uh, advocating for tax dollars that uh, will support youth programs or support prevention uh, programs for for young people or or programs that will help our community uh, young people to take a leadership position and to develop. Um, uh, the next generation of leaders. So there's every reason for um, people to see, uh, uh, you know, this this policy issue as something uh, in which they should be engaged. Great, thank you. And next, we have: Have states other than California engaged in equity investment? If so, what lessons have been learned from their efforts? Dr. Flo Kofer, yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm gonna uh, um, ask Jim to to uh, answer that one because he's been following state by state uh, issues more closely than I have. You know, in uh, the conversations I've had and some of the scanning I've been doing, I have yet to see um, a significant effort around equity uh, in the states that have fully legalized. You know, I have friends in Colorado in the organizing field and I've checked in with them. There certainly have been equity concerns raising that are being raised in states moving towards legalization. A couple months ago, I know that the Black Caucus in the legislature in Maryland, raised, you know, was uh, pushing for an equity conversation and some of the legislation that was either being developed or pending. I think it's growing. And I think it'll continue to grow. And part of what we're trying to do with this webinar is connect with other people in other parts of the country and learn from them. You know, we're just kind of sharing what we've been seeing so far, but I'm, I imagine there are efforts underway in other places that we have no awareness of and that we certainly can learn from. Um, but it's, uh, I think we're, uh, I think that we need to be moving quickly and, and pushing this kind of information out in order to be in a stronger position. Great. And we have we have a, a good list of questions. I'm really excited about this discussion. So uh, do you have ideas about how to balance equitable access to the newly legal marijuana business in communities that were impacted by the war on drugs with concerns about placement and marketing to low income youth of color? Oh wait, well, mm -hmm. Can you repeat that, please? I can't because <laughs> <laughs> it's it on yeah, it was up there. It's on the answer. Sorry, the question was when talking about the public health oh, aspects of this issue, how have the panelists been thinking about and organizing around health equity as it relates to cannabis, i.e., ensuring safe and affordable access to medicinal marijuana for all who need it? Oh, no, 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 that wasn't it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I see where they've been moved to. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, 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 uh. You have ideas about how to balance equitable access to the newly legal marijuana business in communities that were impacted by the war on drugs, low income communities of color, with concerns about the placement and marketing to low income youth of color. Yeah. So it sounds yes. like yeah, I think what, yes. what yeah, Flo's raising here all these various land use issues and issues around advertising and marketing that we have to take into account and we have to be active on in order to you know, really um, protect young people and address the health issues related to young people. And, um, I think this is an area that um, we, need all, we all need to get smarter about. We need folks like Flo with her extensive public health background to be helping us. Uh, and uh, you know, I certainly in my mind, uh, one of the first things we need to start tackling are billboards 
and other uh, other forms of advertising that uh, that we're seeing in in our local city and probably need to be addressing that in state in in, in the state legislative conversation as well. And I would point out on that question that you know there really is a need. Um, to ensure that in communities where you have a lot of boarded up housing, uh, vacant lots, uh, that we don't see the marijuana industry come in and, and just oversaturate marijuana types of businesses in, in uh, communities of color, because that's not the highest and best use of, of those properties. And in California, we have an affordable housing crisis. Uh, we need to build uh, 1.8 new million, uh, 1.8 million new uh, units of housing um, uh, within the next uh, six to seven years to meet uh, demand. And so, if if we're uh, dealing with the uh, the, the placement of marijuana related businesses, which already we're seeing um, a trend of how that is increasing the property values because the landowners and the property owners want to get ma maximum dollar for, for their uh, properties. And so if that increases the, the property values, then it of course makes uh, it difficult to deal with other uh, issues that will uh, impact uh, uh, the health of, of communities of color, uh, such as affordable and safe housing. And so um, I think we want to be aware of, of how that relates to, um, um, uh, you know, what we need to do to, to, to organize and make sure that, uh, you know, equity is a part of the formula. Great, and keeping it going with our, our great questions. Uh, Gregory, we have a question from Gregory. When intersecting with other civil justice issues, do you have a strategy in mind on how to put Prop 64 implementation in those spaces? That's a great question, Greg. I think um, one of the, the perfect examples of, uh, of, 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 of why we need to have strategies in mind that connect the, the implementation of marijuana policy mm -hmm. with civil rights and human uh, justice issues. One of the examples is uh, uh, Philando Castile, uh, the guy who was murdered uh, right there in front of uh, the mother of his uh, child and in front of his child. Um, uh, the police officer smelled uh, um, you know, the, uh, the residuals of, of, of marijuana. Uh, uh, and for some reason, um, thought that Philando Castile needed, deserved to die uh, because uh, of not just how he, he smelled uh, marijuana, but because uh, um, of the other issues around asking for identification and um, uh, then when the person is reaching for identification, you shoot and murder him in cold blood. Um, and we're increasingly seeing uh, laws that are developed that will give uh, law enforcement officers a, a reason to um, pull people over or to search and seize. Um, they're still working on these kinds of laws and, you know, and, and, and it's very disturbing. And so, you know, as far as specific strategies are concerned, you know, I think that we, we definitely have to um, frame this uh, as we're getting and encouraging folks to, to be a part of it, to understand that they, that, this is that this implementation of marijuana policy cannot be separated from uh, police brutality and other issues that we've seen impact communities of color. Great. Um, so next up, uh, a very practical question that I think probably many are, are, are wondering is how do you get that data of marijuana arrests within a city and who, uh, who do you contact? 
You want to take that one, Jim? Yeah, so in, in Oakland and Sacramento, we've been successful in getting our city council to request that the police department do that analysis. Um, our partners, public health advocates, are also in the process of hopeful, hopefully doing a statewide study in California of marijuana arrests and doing mapping in that area. And uh, you know, if all goes as planned, uh, we should be able to have that data for the state of California um, sometime in the middle of next year. But um, in terms of you know, other communities, other states, again, I think this is some, uh, you know, I'm not an, certainly not someone who's an expert in, in uh, data when it comes to the criminal justice system, but I think it's a conversation to start with uh, local officials and see if that sort of data is collected uh, in your community. Great. Thank you. Next up, uh, we have a question around uh, resources. So do you have any suggestions on easy user-friendly resources to help folks dive into understanding the complications of the role of taxes in justice reinvestment? Do you feel an understanding of taxes is needed in order to navigate launching these kinds of campaigns? Hmm. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I think, you know, there is a need for some understanding as to, as to how uh, cities and counties and state governments um, uh, run their, their, their budget making process and how those hearings, uh, legislative hearings uh, uh, at the state, in the state legislature, uh, how the various committees uh, such as budget and audit committees in a city or a county uh, actually work and how to follow. There are organizations um, uh, such as the Advancement Project, I believe, that uh, help grassroots community organizers understand how uh, uh, budget processes uh, work. And so I would recommend uh, that uh, they be referred to as a resource uh, to dive into the understanding of the complications of, uh, around taxes and justice reinvestment. Um, and, and certainly, uh, um, you know, you do want to, to have some sort of understanding and, and stay uh, proactive ab about, um, you know, how taxes, what, what designs uh, and plans uh, various policymakers will have for the use of those taxes. Okay. And next up, uh, what are your thoughts on recent DOJ pushback to decriminalize marijuana? How might that impact justice reinvestment campaigns? Yeah, you know, uh, we have been tracking uh, the conversation at the federal level and certainly are concerned about Jeff Sessions and what he's, you know, what he's been, his comments uh, over the last few months. Um, there has yet to be any change, though, at the legislative or administrative level in the federal government in terms of allowing for states to be uh, certainly involved in medical marijuana uh, as well as recreational. Um, so, I, you know, I think we're just going to have to wait and see. There is bipartisan support in Congress for marijuana legalization. In fact, one of our more conservative uh, Congress members from California sits on that, on a bipartisan committee. Um, so we, I, I think we'll just have to wait and see. Great. And then from Lisa, we have a question on how does the current administration's view on legalization of marijuana impact the progress that's been made in states like California? Uh, do you want to take that one, Jim? Uh, I think that's similar to the question. I, I think she's raising the question about the federal government. Um, yeah, it, it sounds similar. Yeah. yeah. Great. And next we have, do you know any organizations or campaigns considering a serious effort around legalization in Illinois? And if other folks in our chat have an answer to this question, feel free to chat it in. But the question is, do you know any organizations or campaigns considering a serious effort around legalization in Illinois? And I know we have some groups from Illinois on, so um, you feel yeah. free to chat with each other. But do you all have any answers to that? Or do you know any? Oh, we do. We have a question. There is a bill, AB 
um, 1002 that would give 10 million of tax revenue to the UC system to help develop center, a center of cannabis research. How do you feel about this? Hmm. I thought that was an answer to the other question, but it seems like those are two different questions. So we have one question around if there's efforts in Illinois and another question about a particular bill. Well, <laughs> do you, you have, you, I mean, you're in Chicago, Jay. Yeah, I know. Um, I know that there are a, a lot of organizations that work on invest, divest campaigns that are actually considering um, implications for some of the work that's happening in places like California. Um, what we're learning and what I've learned actually from some of the panelists is that um, often the passage of medical marijuana legislation is sort of the gateway to passing full legalization. And so I think that there are a lot of groups that, that work on like I said, Invest Divest in Chicago, like Communities United, that are starting to look into these policies. I'm not adding any work to your plate, Communities United. I just know I've had a conversation specifically with those groups and also groups like um, the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, but they don't have campaigns right now specifically um, around um, how to sort of direct tax revenue that could be generated um, if Illinois is, um, if Illinois legalizes marijuana, um, that's part of what's exciting about today's webinar is it sort of provides an incentive to get ahead of the game in some places that have legalized medical marijuana to start to think about um, if marijuana is fully legalized in your state, how do we make sure that that tax revenue is not used to further criminalize you know, our communities and is actually directed in sound ways. So to answer the question, I know if we could talk offline about groups that are doing solid um, divest invest work that are starting to pay attention a little bit more in Illinois, um, but I don't know of any active campaigns right now. And uh, we did get an answer from one of our uh, participants, uh, Betty from uh, Students for a Sensible Drug Policy, um, organizes campuses around the issue. Um, and they believe their Illinois chapters are more engaged in harm reduction. Mm -hmm. um, so there's also that organization that folks want to outreach to. And I also see folks um, for participants. Um, I love also that that folks are participating in the chat and putting up resources. So also, please take a look at the chat. Um, everybody, uh, uh, other participants are sharing resources in the chat. Um, we're going to take one last question, and then um, we'll move to close out. Um, how can we, as a state, assist organizing other states that have cannabis laws not as progressive as California? Um, well, I think... Um we can continue to have webinars like this. Uh, Jim and I have been working um, uh, since the beginning of the year on a largely volunteer basis, and we have formed uh, a network uh, called the R Plus Hemp Network, Racial and Health Equity and Marijuana Policy. We have a website address, uh, but you know, because you know we're so new, you know, haven't haven't put it up, but. Um, Within the next um, uh, uh, a few weeks, um, uh, I think we'll be able to have some some materials up that uh, organize, organizers around the country can refer to. I'll go ahead and give it to you. It's just rhemp.org. Again, that's R as in racial, H as in health, E as in equity, M as in marijuana, P as in policy, dot O-R-G. Um, I think we can continue having these conversations and uh, have them contribute to uh, our collective ability to, 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 to ensure that uh, um, 
uh, there's fairness and, and, and equity as marijuana policies are implemented across the country. Uh, and maybe Malachi, can Jim, you did, and Jim, did, Jim, did you want to add uh, something to that? I think you're on mute. You're on mute, Jim. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to concur that Malachi and I are happy to be in touch with people in other parts of the country and see how we can be of use and, and happy to interested in learning from others as well. So. Jim, will you put your all's contact slide back up? And then Malachi, will you type in the chat your um, website? And then okay. I, we have maybe one last question, and maybe this one is a good one for Jody. Um, have we thought about how we'll engage parents along with youth? Jody, you're on mute. But have we thought about how we'll engage parents along with youth? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, along the same lines of um, of educating young people, I think reaching out to those parents, I think, again, the disengagement piece is going to be prevalent anytime that you're targeting a particular population, especially those that actually have the information. So I think um, figuring out the medium for your parents is going to be crucial. I know a lot of people send emails and, and, and pamphlets and stuff like that, but people don't have access to it. Um, so it's like, how do you meet them where they are and then give them information? Because that's actually your voter base. I think somebody commented in the, um, in the chat box about 18 to 21 year old youth, which mm -hmm. are the opportunity youth, which are probably the most influential group of young people for this type of work. Um, so yeah, definitely engaging parents as you engage a young person, you should you should definitely be contacting the parent. Um, so it kind of works hand in hand. But I think as we move forward, I know on my end, um, more of the targeted marketing is going to be on the educational piece for um, the 18 and over population. Um, just got to figure out exactly what that looks like. Great. Um, so we want to really thank our panelists for all of the valuable information they've shared. Um, this has been both uh, really educational, I know, for us on the FCYO end as we began to explore this as a webinar and feel very um, privileged that we were able to provide an additional platform for this conversation. Um, again, this webinar will be posted to our website by Monday. Um, so please feel free to share it with your allies and friends and get in contact with folks. I want to remind everyone that this is a part of, this, of um, our Youth Core program. So we um, will continue to have a variety of webinars um, throughout the year and, in, and, and again next year that are on issues that are relevant to um, young people and young people of color. Um, please mark your calendars for, I believe, um, we have a tentative date of October 11th, which we'll be having a webinar on DACA. And we know that issue is, 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 is really um, crucial, crucial and important right now in this time. Um, so thank you all the panelists. Thank you all to the participants. This has been a great discussion and thoughtful questions and really engaging and this is the type of webinars that we want to continue to have. Um, I don't know if any, uh, Jay, if you have any last words or if any of our panelists want to share anything as we close out. Um, no, just thank you to all panelists and I think I, I had planned to actually just um, in, in closing maybe just say to, um, to the panelists just as, as groups start to try to either um, get ahead of the game or, you know, attempt to now organize equity campaigns um, around marijuana policy, is there anything you'd like to say in closing or any last bit of advice you'd like to give? I think I've uh, exhausted uh, <laughs> uh, everything I can think of <laughs> for now certainly would love to you know uh, thank you guys uh, for hosting uh, this webinar um, this is you know it's half the battle is, is having a, a conversation and learning and growing uh, so that we can advance together uh, Jim did you want to add anything Jody yeah, no, I, I, uh, I just think I would just encourage people to get into this uh, and get into it soon if you're not already. I think we have a coherent argument. And I think when people hear the argument over time, support grows for reparations and for racial equity. Great. I think the only piece I'd be able to add is. Uh, uh oh, Jody, you froze.
Well, thank you. Well, um, we, we thank you all again, and thank you everybody who, had, who participated. Um, uh, please uh, sign up to get more information from FCYO, and um, we'll see you all next time.